Good morning, everyone. I'm Niccolo Machiavelli, and I'll be your server this morning. <coughs> um, <clears throat> so I'd like to talk about tablets, big theme of today's event, and the big theme of 2012, as Nina pointed out. Um, I'll start off with, uh, we'll just go over some top line data on tablet adoption to give you a sense of the size of the market and um, where we think it's going. Um, we'll take a look at um, demographics, uh, operating systems. We'll look a little bit at the tablet pipeline, see what's, um, what it looks like today and what's coming in the rest of the year. Um, <clears throat> of course, you know, we, we want to explore the implications for you as magazine publishers, and a big part of that is monetization. So um, let's get started with um, eMarketer's current forecast of tablet users. Now, projecting out to 2014, at that time, 35% of internet users, or 27% of the total population in the US, will be using tablets. And um, if you look back to uh, where we were at the end of 2011 with these numbers, the, the percentage of population is basically doubling, um, and uh, the percentage of, of internet users is uh, also increasing, actually tripling and, and doubling those two numbers. So we're looking at a very steep uh, increase. Um, <clears throat> Now, this forecast gives you a sense of a, this is a two-year outlook for tablets and compared to smartphones and e-readers. Now, smartphones are still a hot item and we do see plenty of growth, uh, but the upward curve for tablets is obviously much steeper. And when it comes to e-readers, we're really starting to see the cannibalization from tablets and this will only continue as the years go on. So really, the momentum here is centered on tablets. Now, We've been focusing lately uh, on number of users at eMarketer, which of course is related to, but not the same as the number of devices, because there's a certain amount of sharing that goes on, especially with tablets. So if you have 80 million users, it doesn't mean that there are 80 million units in circulation. Um, but even if you, if you look at just the unit volume, you still see a very, very sizable uh, upward curve. Can we use the lectern mics? Okay, sorry about that. So um, yeah, so we're, we're basically looking at 38% growth compounded annually. So that's every year for the next four years uh, on a global level. Um, here we're looking at the same time frame, but uh, this is the installed base. So um, you know, people uh, keep their tablets from year to year. So you end up with um, you know, the, the rate of acquisition is faster than the rate of attrition. So the worldwide installed base ends up at uh, 380 plus, th 388 million by 2015. Now, in, in 2011, the iPad had a whopping 83% of the US market. And even though Apple's competitors are making a dent in that share, when we project out to 2014, we still expect Apple to have more than a third of a share. So you have a single company that commands a larger portion of the market than all its competitors combined. So this, of course, has implications. Sorry again, I'll, I'll shout. <clears throat> um, that's what Machiavelli would have done. Um, Kindle Fire sales are, are living up to its name. Uh, the product got off to a very fast start in late 2012 and is going to enjoy triple digit growth this year and then healthy double digits in the next two years. Now, not only are the numbers of Kindle Fires on a very aggressive upward path, but the revenue from content driven by those tablets is also um, increasing very rapidly. And uh, this is from a Barclays forecast that projects more than five billion in revenue uh, just associated with the Kindle Fire by 2014. 
Now, the study was not specific in how much of this content would be derived from magazine subscriptions or magazine advertising. So, um, you know, and I tend to think that movie rentals and downloads and books and games um, comprise a lot of this revenue. So I don't want to give the impression that the magazine publishing industry is staring at a $5 billion opportunity just around the Kindle Fire, but I want to show this because it, it, it shows that the magnitude of this revenue and the rapid curve that it's following um, suggests that Amazon's tablet business is precipitating a flow of dollars toward digital content. So let's take a quick look at some demographics here. In, in Q3 of 2011, Nielsen found that tablet owners were predominantly male by, by a small margin, and they also found that the, the largest single cluster of tablet owners was 18 to 34 year olds. And both of these data points fit with the conventional wisdom that's developed around tablets, which is that typical users tend to be young and, and tech-savvy males. But as the, mar as the market grows and matures, the demographic distinctions start falling away, and it starts to look more like the population as a whole. And to that point, this is a more recent profile from Pew. It showed a couple of interesting developments. First. Um, the percentage of survey respondents who own tablets actually doubled in the space of a month, it just, just over the holiday uh, quarter. So um, this recent period has been very, very good to tablets, and, and that's causing some researchers, researchers to uh, revise their estimates upward. But here's another thing in this survey about the demographics that the gender gap is actually closing. So. Right now we're at parity and you know a year ago that was not quite the case, so that's interesting. This survey also looked at some education and income level uh, parameters and found somewhat predictably that um, you know tablet owners tend to be on the educated and affluent side. Now just as the iPad has by far the lead in the device space, uh, Apple's iOS has the biggest share of the market with Android at number two and gaining. And really, there's no other game in town here. I mean, Microsoft had 1.5% and uh, all other competitors amounted to 1.9%. So we are looking at a two horse race from the standpoint of tablets at this point. Now, if you throw smartphones into the mix, Apple and Google still have more than three quarters of the market. There's obviously a little bit of representation from RIM with Blackberry, but that's um, kind of a falling curve, and I think we're looking at the beginning of a disappearing act there. Although, we have all seen companies that were written off only to come back stronger than ever, Apple being the most prominent example. So, uh, I think it's a little early to write anyone's obituary, and it's important to keep an eye on how this operating system space evolves. Um, I'm particularly interested in looking at Windows 8 from the standpoint of how it supports all devices and it's really built from the ground up as an operating system for tablets and PCs and, and really any device. Um, Apple is heading in a similar direction with iOS and the Mountain Lion uh, OS X operating system which are really quite integrated and they're starting to borrow features from each other. We're going to see more and more of this as time goes on. So just in the last few months, the market got a lot more interesting with new form factors in, in the tablet space. So uh, taking a look at the pipeline, let's uh, kind of step through some of the major ones. And of course, the best place to start is with the iPad. Um, as I noted earlier, this is the clear category leader with 83% of the US market last year. And a pace setter, uh, or as a friend of mine likes to say, it's Apple's world and everybody else just gets to play in it. Apple just announced that um, the iPad contributed over $9 billion in revenue in the most recent fiscal quarter, which was 20% of its total revenue. And it kind of makes it uh, easier to forget that it's been on the market for less than two years. During the past quarter, iPad sales were more than double what they were a year earlier. So if anything, people's appetite for this product is getting stronger at a time when you might expect it to start leveling off. And, of course, Apple just announced the third generation iPad and over the weekend they sold three million units uh, after going on sale on Friday. So uh, the momentum continues for Apple. Let's drill down to the Kindle Fire and what makes it tick. 
Um, one of the biggest things that it did was break that $200 price barrier for a media tablet. So this creates a, a bifurcation in the market where you really have this kind of $400, $450, $500 and up range, and then you've got a $200 range. So depending on what you want out of your tablet, uh, you have some choices. The um, estimates for, for Kindle Fire sales in the last quarter are ranging in the five and a half, six million range. Um, it uses a, a customized version of Android, um, not quite recognizable as, um, as Android operating system. It, it is more stripped down, of course, for its price point. <clears throat> um, and most importantly for this room, it really is optimized for book and magazine reading. Um, another important thing, and this is the reason for the, the price point that Amazon is able to deliver here, is that this is really almost a loss leader. Um, you know, Amazon sells these devices essentially at cost or at a slight loss, and they do the same with software, and it's really all about driving e-commerce business, and especially driving membership in the Prime program. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the estimates are that Prime uh, members spend three to four times more than other Amazon customers. So just as the Kindle sparked the fire, uh, pun intended, the, the Nook Color spawned the Nook tablet. This one is also Android based, though again, not really, uh, doesn't really have the feel of an Android tablet. It's, it's very um, much, you know, a Barnes and Noble product. Um, definitely important that it, it also comes from a strong book in magazine DNA. <clears throat> and the parallels with the Kindle Fire don't end there. Uh, as you probably know, Barnes & Noble dropped the price to $199 after it was uh, launched at uh, $249. So this is obviously um, going head to head now in a big way with the Kindle Fire. The Motorola Zoom is now in its second generation, sort of. Uh, this one was supposed to be the iPad killer last year, but it never quite lived up to that billing. Um, this version is faster, slimmer, lighter, and it's designed to compete head-to-head -head with iPad on price and features, so um, <clears throat> we'll see how that goes for Motorola. The Sam Samsung Galaxy Tab is another reborn product. It uses Android Honeycomb, which is, of course, a more uh, tablet-specific of the operating systems. <clears throat> Priced uh, at 400 it's gotten good reviews. CNED called it the Android tablet of choice. Um, Samsung had a little bit of the wind knocked out of its sails with some litigation with Apple and without getting into the specifics, um, that's essentially been settled and now they can kind of compete on a level playing field. Uh, the Asus ePad, also honeycomb based and also aggressively priced. This one has a docking station that kind of turns it into a netbook, and that points up an interesting uh, dilemma that tablet makers have, which is that, um, um, you know, some people like their tablets to fit in their hands and feel like a paperback book. Um, others want their tablets to do everything that PCs do, so it's, it's definitely a balancing act for them. This one has a widescreen, which makes it appealing for video streaming. The T-Mobile G Slate had 4G support uh, before iPad, and it's very much designed for TV streaming, comes with a lot of built-in video apps and other content. Uh, price point is a little higher, so you're not going to see it compete with other um, honeycomb tablets on price alone. Sony is fighting the price war with a tablet that's um, priced to undercut Apple. Um, it's getting to where this strategy may not pay off because you're not only competing with Apple, but you're competing against all the other products that, um, you know, that are in this very increasingly crowded space now. Sony has a lot of entertainment and gaming IP that they bring to the table. Um, <clears throat> of course, you know, the, the reader software and compatibility with ebook and e-magazines is important um, with Sony. And true to Sony's DNA as a TV maker, this one doubles as kind of a sophisticated remote control unit, which you wouldn't want to lose between the couch cushions. <clears throat> um, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, why this is all important to publishers. We'll look at what some publishers are saying about the tablet space. 
We'll look at how tablets fit in the device ecosystem, talk about audience migration, uh, digital newsstands, uh, look at how tablets represent a whole new way of engaging with digital content. Uh, I'd like to look a little bit at back issues, which are interesting. We'll go over some top line stats on advertising and how tablets can help in that regard. We'll zero in on some revenue streams and um, look at um, <clears throat> where the opportunities are to project brands through tablets. So what are publishers saying? Bob Sauberg of Condé Nast said tablets represent a $15 million opportunity that didn't exist a year ago. And David Carey of Hearst talks about $10 million in consumer revenue from digital and how he didn't think it would be possible, but he can now see it happening. Of course, there are equally forceful arguments on the other side. Jan Wenner of Rolling Stone and Us Weekly thinks it's inevitable that magazine readers will gravitate toward tablets, but he thinks the shift will take a generation or more. So he's talking about decades, not months or years. Tom Hardy of Meredith brings up a good point that we should all keep in mind that you know, we, we can talk optimistically about growth with tablets, but right now the numbers are small and, and there's no getting around that. So you know, this will take time to scale and, and there will be some pain along the way. <clears throat> there's been a lot of talk also about how we're in this post-PC world. <clears throat> Tim Cook said that he felt from the start when they launched the iPad that it would eventually overtake the PC and um, the analyst Horace de Dieu thinks, thinks that the tablet market by units will be larger than the PC market next year. Now that time frame strikes me personally as a little bit aggressive and Piper Jaffrey agrees, so they're looking at a tipping point of 2017. One thing that is happening in real time is a shift in the way publishers are organizing themselves to publish digitally. The Economist just consolidated its tablet and uh, digital uh, web units, and they put Oscar Groot in charge, and he, um, he was overseeing tablets. So that kind of gives you a sense of where the, um, the uh, momentum is going. And uh, the Weather Channel did something similar. Uh, they separated their mobile and tablet units and uh, really beefed up tablets because they see it as a more valuable category. All this publishing activity on the tablet side is resulting in a new wave of digital newsstands, aggregators, and apps that are designed to make electronic magazines easier to read, uh, easier to find, and to make the whole process more appealing to readers. So you've got these branded content storefronts that may be specific to a device or a digital portal. You've got e-magazine apps like Zinio and social readers like Flipboard and Pulse. So a lot of companies are trying to position themselves between the content and the reader. Um, it's a little bit of a gold rush mentality right now, and as usual, Apple seems to be pulling into pole position with iOS Newsstand, which came with iOS 5. So here are a couple of proof points of what Newsstand did for publishers just from the get-go. In the UK, Future Publishing saw incremental revenue of a million dollars per month after the Newsstand launched uh, last fall. And Condé Nast reported an increase of 268% in subscriptions just in the two weeks following the launch. Another thing that's interesting as a result of tablets is an increase in sales of uh, single copy back issues. Now, you've all enjoyed <clears throat> a revenue stream over the years from people buying back issues in print, but with digital, this process is obviously much easier and more conducive to um, incremental business. Bonnier Corp said 40% of its... Um, single digital copies or back issues. Hearst said 30% of single copies on tablets or back issues. And 25% of Martha Stewart Living and Everyday Food iPad single issue copies are back issues. Contrast that to what's happening in the print world and in the second half of 2011, single copy newsstand volume was down by 10% and the top five selling magazines all saw substantial decreases according to the ABC and those are the numbers. At the same time that people are moving away from print, they're not only reading digital editions, but they're wanting to shop through them. 70% of respondents in this survey by GFK said they wanted to be able to click through ads in, news, in, in magazines to make direct purchases. <clears throat> the MPA reached similar conclusions in its own survey, found that 59% of respondents 
wanted to make purchases through ads, and 70% wanted to buy through articles and features. So people are telling you that they want to use your publication, both its content and its advertising, in part as a purchase tool. The backdrop to this data, as we all know, is a decline or at least a flatness in the print ad business. So here's a snapshot of how various organizations see this. At eMarketer, we see growth rates ranging from uh, 0 to 1 percent in the next few years, and this is coming from slightly negative growth in 2010. Now this chart is growth only. It's showing percentage growth from year to year. PwC is an outlier. They're actually the reason why this chart needs any headroom at all above about 2%. Uh, Barclays sees a flat line. Deutsche Bank ranges from negative 3 to 0. Zenith Optimedia is trending downward into negative terrain. And then there are a handful of other shorter range forecasts that at best hit 2% but are mostly negative. So, Clearly, this is a picture of a revenue segment that's flatlining, so the industry really needs a shot in the arm from digital. And actually, the forecast for online magazine advertising does show growth, even if digital makes up a small percentage of the total. Um, in a five-year span, online will grow by a total of 67% to 4.5 billion. And this, small, this uh, a small gain in overall magazine advertising will come entirely from digital, because as you can see, Print is dead flat at 15.3 billion for that whole span of time. So advertising offers some hope, and of course, paywalls are another revenue contributor, but monetization from paid content, as you all know painfully well, is challenging. This Pew survey indicated that only 21% of US tablet newsreaders would pay $5 a month to access this content digitally, and predictably, even fewer would pay $10. So, it's an uphill battle fighting that widespread and deeply ingrained perception that digital content should be free. I realize that. But as difficult as it is to monetize digital media, it's, given, it's getting even harder to monetize print, judging uh, from the figures I shared earlier on advertising and newsstand sales. So as, as we know, print revenues are stagnant, uh, newsstand revenues are down. On the flip side, Digital advertising will take time to scale, but it is on a growth track. And yes, consumers are reluctant to spend, but they have shown that they'll pay for value, which is important. And all this is translating to some momentum on the digital side. <clears throat> uh, and um, you know that, that is where the, the momentum is headed. So <clears throat> before I open up the floor to questions, and by the way, for questions, we're going to be passing around a mic, so please, um, you know, raise your hand and we'll, we'll get a mic to you for you to ask your questions. I'll leave you with a few takeaways. <clears throat> First, you really want to take advantage of the e-commerce potential of tablets. I know it's easier said than done, but your customers are telling you that they want to shop through your digital products, so why not enable that? Think of tablets as a new medium that represents for reader and publisher alike a whole new way of engaging with magazine content. This is not print, it's not the web, it's not mobile. If you can, develop for as many publishing platforms as possible, but if your resources are limited, start with iOS. That's, that's where the audience is, that's where the dollars are, and that's really the, the zeitgeist of tablet publishing today. Your readers will migrate to tablets, so follow them. Jan Wenner may be right, it may take a generation, or it may take a few years, or it may take less than that. Um, every step along the way will bring some pain points, but also new opportunities for you to hone your strategies and realize new revenue. Monetization on the digital side will be challenging indeed, but the expected increases in device ad adoption will result in increased scale, and of course, the bigger the pie gets, the more attractive it will be for the brands that have supported your print products so far. And finally, tablets will continue to get better, cheaper, faster, slimmer, slicker, and more appealing to your readers, and print, unfortunately, won't. So with that, I thank you for your time, and I would be very happy to take questions. All right. If there are no questions, we'll end up with a... Oh, wait, there are. Okay. Gentleman in the front. 
here, well, three rows back, we can get a mic to this gentleman, please. Um, you were saying about developing uh, for all platforms, but start with uh, iOS. What is the potential of HTML5 to make it possible for publishers to develop more economically across all platforms? I think that's coming. It's definitely, um, it will get easier to consolidate your tablet development so that you're not, you know, splitting your resources among many, many different channels and, and platforms. You know, at this point, just like the whole space is very fragmented and, and getting crowded with, um, you know, a lot of different apps and, and you know, to just a lot of, a lot of channels, um, it, it will get easier. I mean, I, I can't tell you when or if there will be a tipping point, but for sure HTML5 is, is a technology that normalizes a lot of the development that up until now has been fragmented. Yes. Right over here, please. Same row. I'm curious what your take is on the uh, difference between, say, um, you know, a fully designed enhanced version of a magazine compared to digital replicas. Yeah, I, I think they're, um, they're going to be um, there's going to be a panel later that explores that in more depth. My feeling is that the digital replica um, is almost a wasted opportunity in the sense that you can do so much with tablets. You can deliver content so much more dynamically. You know, there's that, that line in that Billy Joel song that there's a new band in town, but you can't get the sound from a story in a magazine. Well, now you can. You know, and now, you know, Rolling Stone can develop an app where a reader can click through and actually hear music. <clears throat> um, so why not do that? You know, if you're, um, you know, if you have um, recipes in your magazine, why not have a video tutorial along with that? There are just so many things you can do, which I understand, believe me, that it's not like you can all flip a switch and make all this stuff happen. But you know, most publishing companies are very horizontally diverse and can pull resources from different publications and different development centers to, you know, to make some of this stuff happen. And I think you want to think in those directions. I mean, there is a place for the replica. It, it's, it's, it is sort of on a title by title and company by company basis. But my feeling is go forth and experiment. We probably have time for one more quick question. So, gentleman back there. Um, Paul, my question is, with the cost of print, which doesn't go down, it still remains as expensive to print, and transitioning over to tablets, does it offset it, or is it just as expensive as print, just developing these apps? Well, I think right now the, the costs are higher than they will become, for sure, because the, the, you know you really the teams are not well cemented. The development platforms are are very diverse and not compatible. So right now, yeah, it's you know you have to make an investment. You have to make hard decisions. You have to make compromises. You have to put out some replicas because it's probably better to do that than to do nothing. But over time, you know, you, you figure out how to, um, how to channel those resources and, and develop. You know, digital development should be cheaper simply because you can repurpose those assets in a lot of different ways. You know, it doesn't always work out that way, but I think being smart and creative about how you develop is part of the challenge and you know, there will be rewards from that kind of approach. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of the event.